Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Wednesdays with Winton. Thanks for joining us again for our eighth episode, if you can believe that or not. My name is Madeline Gardner. I am the PR and external comms manager at Jazz and Lincoln Center. And thanks for joining us. Winton will be with us in just one moment for a casual Q&A. So if you want to go ahead and start typing in any of your questions for Winton uh, in the chat box below, I will try to get to as many of them as possible. And I want to remind you, we have tons of really exciting stuff going on at Jazz Lincoln Center virtually. If you head to jazz.org, you can see the full schedule. We have master classes, education classes, everything, archival concerts, live streaming concerts from Artist Home, a little bit of everything. And today, as we always do on Wednesdays, we were releasing uh, concerts from the Jazz Lincoln Center vault. Today, we released uh, the Free to Be Jazz of the 1960s. That's with the JLCO and Winter Marsalis. And they're performing masterpieces by Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane, Dave Brubeck, Charles Mingus, and includes music directors, the uh, wonderful Walter Blanding's debut of a big band arrangement of Sonny Rollins' historic Freedom Suite. So you can check that out if you head over to Jazz Lincoln Center's YouTube page after this Q&A. So without any further ado, let's see if Winton is here. Hi, Winton. Hey, now, what you talking about, Maddie? We're talking about our vault video today. All the right. Free to be Jazz of the 1960s, which is... Excellent concert. If you can maybe kick us off by talking about that concert a little bit, how it came to be, and what's it all about? Well, I think we, Walter Blanding did it. It was just about the whole freedom of the 1960s, the consciousness movement. And it's a good day for it because this is the day that SpaceX is launching uh, the, the, the two astronauts in the space. I love seeing them. They're so calm. And, you know, be, me being a person that's afraid to fly, I always look at it with just a, just kind of terror. So, the 60s was also the period of space space exploration. Mm -hmm. And it's talking about the, the space exploration takes you out here and free to be is about going inside here and dealing with the depths of the human soul. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the, the, the macro and the micro, what me and, me and Sean Carroll yep. were talking about. And uh, Walter is a person who, co who comes from that spirit of the freedom movement. Mm -hmm. And he believes in a type of equality of people. He's one of the great humanists in the band, speaks five or six languages. And uh, we, we dealt with Sonny Rollins' Freedom Suite. Walter did uh, arrangements of it. And he wrote also an original composition that uh, you know, is, is Walterian. What's it like to, to um, watch these concerts back? I know we've talked about before, you know, as a, a musician, you know, you have a snapshot while you're playing of what it sounds like. Do you okay. ever feel like watching these concerts back, you're surprised and you're like, oh, okay. Like yeah, I'm too critical. I almost never listen to my own music or if, I, if I'm working on a recording, I'll listen to it. But after that, I almost never listen to it because wow. I'm, I'm too critical of what's wrong. I don't like all the mic stands. I don't like the way it is. <laughs> I, the part is not, the sound is not, you know, so I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't run myself through it. But when I'm studying it, sometimes I try, a, a lot of times it's, it's, some things are better than I thought they were and some things are, are not as good. Hmm. And I see things that I would like to change but uh, I, I was there, so I, I heard it. Yeah. I, I try to. I don't know. It's, it's difficult. I like to see other people playing, but if, right. if it's something we're doing, and I like if, if Walter sold one, yeah, I love it. I can check it out, but I don't. I don't want to see myself. I understand. When I'm uh, uh, after these, if I ever watch these back, I'm like, that's what I sound like. I did not realize <laughs> right. that was the sound of my voice. So right, it's interesting. Right. It's the, you know, yes, the kind of self perspective. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, to quickly touch base on the top, and I know I've seen some comments already. Sadly, this week we lost another great Jimmy Cobb. I'm wondering if you could regale any, any stories or memories you have of Jimmy just to keep the thoughts of him alive and, and sweet memories of him alive. Well, Jimmy was just uh, so, so deeply soulful. The last, uh, last time we, we talked was about him going to Julia to speak to our students. And uh, I talked to his daughter. He, he, he went and he, he gave a master class for, for the students and uh, you know it's just it's, it's that time is rough because you know you don't get endless soul because we're talking about it earlier we talk about space we talk about the soul there's people who are like touchstones and, and it's not just in their presence but in their playing mm. in the feeling of their playing and and when you start to put everybody together it's one feeling it's individual parts of a general overall feeling and where we have so many fantastic things that are always going on 
the challenge of human beings is how do we collect our experiences and our memory as we embrace the things that are ha that are are happening we experience those things and we reach for other things so you know yes it's, it's, it's tragic it's so many uh so many people going it's always it still hits me with wallace too because we came to new york around the same time it's like and of course, well, it, with my father, many people, I, I, go, I have to go back to what my father said, that the loss for people of their loved ones at any time, it's, it's a, right. it, 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 it hurt, it's painful. Do you, do you remember the first time you met Jimmy Cobb? Any, any, any oh, fun yeah. stories of, of playing with Jimmy? Yeah, it was, it was years ago. Mm. You know, because I had hung out with Philly Joe Jones, and uh, this was 1980. I hung with Philly Joe. Philly Joe took me all around New York. We're talking about Miles because Philly Joe had played with Miles and then, then Jimmy Cobb, Jimmy played with Miles. And um, I just in, then it, in those days, I would go to all the clubs, 1980, 81, 82. I would leave my apartment at midnight and just go to every club. We, we called Make It The Rounds, me, Tame, Bramford. We would go out. And uh, yeah, I met everybody during that period, whoever was hanging at the Sweet Basils or the Vanguard or 7th Avenue South or, uh, Lush Life was a club on Bleecker Street. Uh, yeah, we go to all the places, bottom line, you know. So I, I saw him during that period. Mm. And it was always so, just because my daddy is a, was a jazz musician, and they, they, they knew him and of him, so they were always very embraced me and treated me with a lot of love and, and, and feeling. And, you know, you bring up an, an interesting point, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, people in the jazz community and musicians in general, especially in New York, and I know lots of other places, they meet and, and you know, going out at 12 at the jazz clubs, playing right, with right. each other. What's, um, what would you suggest now in this time when we don't have that option, how uh, musicians can maybe meet each other or connect or, or try to put themselves out there to meet new, new other musicians to collab with? You know, just call and, and get online. And like, what we're doing, we're talking now. I, I don't see, I see you once a week now. I'm looking at you, and I think if you if you're active in this space, this is also a space. Mm -hmm. uh, there's play, there's ways to meet people. I mean, pe people are meeting online now. We, yeah, remember back then there was no online. So now it's a. Uh, th this is a space, and human mm -hmm. beings figure out how to work any space. Right. You know, we're like roaches in that way. <laughs> if there's a space, we're gonna figure out how to get in there. And, That's very true. Uh, all we have to do is be embracing of a space and the possibilities that exist in that space and mm -hmm. not resistant to the space. And we, we can make stuff happen. Make it happen. Make stuff yeah. happen. Make it. You just get in there. That's another one thing we say. Get, it, get, it, get up in there. That's what they say. <laughs> when you get in the time, good. I hear you getting up in there. Get in there. Well, I will say, I think that jazz has some of my favorite terms. The jazz terminology really is is quite incredible. Yeah, yeah. When I when I was growing up, I always loved hearing the musicians talk because their slang was different from the regular slang we had on the street. Mm. And just like cats and gigs, and, and, and you got your axe for your horn, and uh, cat got some chops. I mean, then these <laughs> are older terms, but just the, then they were old then. But in my, my generation, we didn't use those kind of, those kind of terms. So when the jazz mm -hmm. musicians would start to talk, I always would be laughing. And they always had good, good nicknames, too. For like other musicians, they'd be listening to somebody, yeah, that's frog. It's because of some kind of animal. That's right. <laughs> Any that honey bear, anybody who looked like an animal, that was their name. And then I when that. I was growing up in the country, you know, we had, we had a thing that we would do where I understood later the, the value of it. Is if you had any defining characteristic, there may be something a person would be ashamed of that would become your nickname. Mm -hmm. So if you had one eye that was bigger than the other one, you'd be big eye. If you had a, we had one, one, one person had a kind of, kind of skin disease, they call them half head. So, you know, you would, and the people would embrace their nicknames. Like it wasn't like you were taunting or teasing, but it was just the style of that time and that, in that place. That's beautiful, though. You know, it's taken that what other people might seem as ugly or different and right and being proud of it. And make it, yeah. You know, so if you're skinny, you slim. They've always called me slim. Then I'm skinny. Yeah, slim. Or my, my partner was a guy named Theodore. We called him Fedo, but they also called him heavy. So, you know, man, we're heavy. And it, it just, I don't know, I could go on and on with the yeah. nicknames we had was so crazy. And the jazz musicians had good, but they still have good nicknames. Today in a lot of arenas, you know, they have good, mm -hmm. people come up with good colorful names. 
Well, I wanted to, to bring up too before we go, I know I've seen some questions and don't forget everybody, if you're just joining us, please go ahead and ask any questions in the chat box below. Um, it was a big week uh, in jazz birthdays. Yesterday, we we're celebrating Miles Davis and today, the wonderful DG, DD Bridgewater. And I was wondering, do you remember the first time that you either listened to uh, a Miles tune or the first time you saw or heard DD play? Well, with, with, with Miles, um, my father loved Miles, so it was, I mean, I grew up with him listening to Miles. So I think the first record, I, one of the first jazz records I ever listened to was Miles Davis, Someday My Prince Will Come, mm. because I liked the way the lady on the cover looked. My brother and I were looking at all of our records laid out on the floor, and my daddy's records, then it was only albums. And I said, man, why do people look crazy on our records, and they look normal on daddy's records? So. We never listened to jazz records. My father was always listening to them. I was maybe 12 then, 11, I don't know. And I said, man, let's listen to that one. That was the Miles Davis, Someday My Press Will Come album. And I remember I listened to it, I asked my father, can you write out this, uh, could you write this solo out for me? He said, man, you, you need to learn the solo by ear. You don't need to have it written out. But hmm. then the next day or something, he had written it out for me. And, and I was trying to play it. He said, you're not gonna get it. You gotta listen to it. It was the solo on Someday My Press Will Come. With the changes, he was always telling me, learn how to play the piano, man, learn how to play the piano. I never learned. I guess I showed him. So <laughs> uh, that, and with Dee Dee, I knew Cecil, because the trumpet player, Cecil Bridgewater, I didn't know their relationship. But I think I first heard Dee Dee in the, in, the, in the late 70s, early, yeah, 70s. And then she's so fantastic, you know, like magic dust. Mm -hmm. all, all just, just the kind of fantastic creativity and, and invention. And I thought, Man, they got a whole family of them that can play. You know, because in New Orleans, we had a lot of families, like like, uh, like the Jordans and the Baptiste and the, and the Nevilles and this. So that's the first time I heard her Dee Dee. It was just a, just a kind of fantastic way she used, used her voice as an instrument. And how she could just, she's so creative with, her, with her, the variety of what she could do on a, what mm. she can do on a song, not could do, can do. She is. She's and she was. She made a great uh, Skeins Domain guest. And those tuning in, if you don't know, we have a program called Skeins Domain every Monday, uh, EDT at 9 p.m. And Winton is joined by a variety of guests and also all of you viewers tune in for uh, another kind of Q and A with Winton. And we had DD join us, which was really great. You talked about you know from a, a variety of things of of what it's like to get you know your albums reviewed or you know what it's like <laughs> playing with other people so it was it's really fun to watch you interact and talk about that well i loved her and chick you know and they were talking about gigs they were on and i always love to hear people talk about when they first met oh 1972 and i was on this session and horace said this and that so i thought that was yeah fantastic always to to give people a sense of how the musicians talk when they always loved when the, the older jazz musicians talk about the past or I see Dizzy and, and, and he start talking to Sweets and they start talking about people. You gotta talk about little Bobby Moore. Uh, Dizzy, you remember Bobby Moore? Oh, I remember <laughs> Bobby Moore. And, and on and on and on. That's like a great part of the tradition. Mm. It is. And um, I want. I saw something before. What What do you think is the most underappreciated instrument in a jazz band? <laughs> bass. Mm. Bass. You gotta and listen why, to the and bass. Why is that? Well, it, it, traditionally, it was the softest instrument. It's just like our democracy. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to the softest thing. And it makes you have integrity. Okay, the rhythm guitar really was that. That's like the consciousness in the four-piece rhythm section. Then the bass is the lowest. It's the softest. It defines the motion of the bottom harmony. And it requires that the loudest at that time and most powerful instrument give way to the softness of that instrument. So the drums, you have the, the most powerful, the president is forced to, is checked by the bass, the judiciary. Now, just like our system is absolutely, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, the corruption is in our system, not even right now, okay? I'm, I never, I'm never topical when I discuss these issues because it's so mm. complete and it's been going on for such a long time that now you don't even have the sense of that check and balance and in jazz it's the same. Now the bass just turn their amps up, so hmm. they, they can be the loudest. Then you have the, the lowest instrument, and it's supposed to be the subs. Now, boom, boom, boom. And then the drums are just like, yay. You know, now I don't have to. I can just play as loud as I want, <laughs> and the rest of y'all can do. Then we get back at them, because then we just solo all night. Hmm. So, you know, you might have a saxophone, and you ain't going to compete with the drums, and you definitely going to mess with the bass. 
<laughs> but you are definitely going to play a good 35 or 40 courses. So mm. when you get into the kind of cacophonous relationship, I don't mean music, I just mean cacophonous emotional relationship where, you know, okay, mm. you know, you took the last piece of chicken, I'm going to pour some of this Kool-Aid on your rice. So, you know, now it's like, and you know, <laughs> then you get to a point where you don't even know you're doing it. It becomes, becomes normal. Mm. Then you just get a monitor and you defend yourself by saying, turn me up in the monitor. So you can see how we started with certain kind of balanced challenges. Mm. And over time, we just said, well, we can't. These challenges are too much for us. Mm. And then it just became a bandstand and something. When you have all that sound, monitors, everybody with themselves, and it's just everybody's six feet apart and everything is. So I think, I think the bass for me is always uh, the instrument. That you can tell the humanity of a group by how it listens to the bass. Mm. The heartbeat, right? Is it the heartbeat it's, of the? Yeah, it's the center of everything. Mm. You know, there's always a joke about bass players when they're soloing. You know, it's time to talk now. <laughs> Must be That's a bass funny. solo. But I love the bass. I'm always listening to the bass, and I mean, the bass is it's a lot about the integrity of the band mm. is in the bass. And, and speaking of, of bassists, uh, Carlos Enrique is, of course, the bassist of the Jazz Lings and Orchestra, right. uh, bringing up EE, e. essentially Ellington. Uh, we recently announced they'll be doing a week long virtual, essentially Ellington. And what does, you know, I mean, I think the answer is pretty obvious, but I think maybe you can, you know, get into a bit. What does it mean to be able to keep essentially Ellington going even right now? When, you know, obviously we wish we could be in the hall, but what does this mean to you, to the organization, to jazz in general? Well, it means a lot to see our really talented, great young people as more than a market to sell something mm -hmm. to. Um, the program is we give away a lot of free scores and we send clinicians to schools and we have long-standing relationships with with youngsters who now have youngsters. Carlos kids are in high school. Kiko is, you know, <laughs> he's his, his oldest son is like a grown man. He's bigger than all of us. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's a lifetime investment. And we just teach uh, the principles that are in Duke Ellington's music, how to be a better citizen, how to listen, how to play in balance. That we have a uh, histories and tradition, we can face the future with confidence, how to be creative, how to trust your collective creativity to respect other people, on and on and on, the things we... So for us, it's very, very important, and also to have the community of the young people recognize and have them recognize that community. Because so much of the times in our culture, younger people are put at odds with older people, at odds with your parents so we can sell something to you, at odds with... Uh, anything that's adult or mature, because we want you to stay a kid as long as possible so we can sell something to you and exploit you with some propaganda. With this, it's more education. And Duke's music is so much about you finding your own way. You can't even turn it into propaganda. Like any, anything you read about Duke, he was like, you know, find yourself. And I, I'm very proud of, of our young people. This year is going to be international. So we have 18 na national bands mm -hmm. and we have five international bands. And these young people are, I mean, they're, they're fantastic, not just as musicians and artists. They're just so, I encourage everybody to, to check it out. It's, I don't know the exact dates. It's in June or something. Yes, something. June, week of June 8th, week of June 8th, all week, June, June 8th to June 12th. Yep. And we're, we're going to have it coming at you. You're going to see kids that are, there's some fa fantastic ones around the world and, and in our own country. And the work they do when they're band directors and communities, uh, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a life-changing event for me. I saw so much growth and development over 25 years mm. that I can see how kids will do things you can't imagine they will do with their soul and their feeling. We know they can achieve things technically, and we know they can achieve things uh, from a competitive standpoint athletically, and we know they can achieve things that, that there's a great prize put on. But something like soul or a, a kind of community, or that's always the least paid, it's always the least. We, we tend, to, tend to reward the most predatory. Right. If, if something is predatory and can exploit more people and make more money off of it and abuse them more, we tend to love that. Mm -hmm. And when a person is in the community working, giving it, that tends to be like, yeah, you know, what did they make? So I, I think our young people, and we also tend to think of them only as a kind of hyper market that we can sell kind of semi-pornographic video products to. Mm -hmm. They're much more than that. And when we give them the opportunity to be much more than that, it doesn't mean that they have to divorce themselves from all of what we subject them to, to propagandize them and, and, and treat them as a market. They can mm -hmm. still have that, but they also develop this other component and understanding of the riches that are in, in the other direction too.
Absolutely. And I, I encourage everyone to, to, to tune in. Week of June 8th, you can head to jazz.org uh, slash EE25 to learn how to tune in and learn more. It's going to be a really meaningful week. And another great way to support uh, um, musicians, you know, yeah. not only it's which which is obviously very important during this time. Um, yeah, any, any other uh, suggestions on how whether, you know, people tuning in are musicians or not, how we can support artists and uh, right now? You know, go online, look at, at things you, you like, people you like, donate to them. Mm -hmm. Go go grassroots. Like, you know, I'm from little towns in Louisiana, like Bro Bridge, Little Farms, Hanson City, Kenner. That's like four cities we lived in, Opelousas, the first, when I, was, when I was growing up. And if somebody was sick or if something happened, there was a death in someone's family, people go down the street with some food for them. Mm -hmm. It was old school South, segregated, railroad track, the the... the the river and those kind of values they get inculcated into your way. I still, even though we're in the world we're in now, and I live in Manhattan, it's not the same kind of vibe. But even my neighbors in my building, you know, if they when they heard about my dad, they brought me some food. So I'm not gonna, I, you know, say they are you all right? We go out shopping. We, you need something, and mm. the, the values still are, are are here. But that's what you can do: go online and look at them, and and don't they realize if they're freelance musicians, they're struggling. Mm -hmm. People, people trying to trying to trying to eat. This is a rough situation, and this is it, is going to be rough. And our nation is not the best from a national standpoint at uh, embracing the arts. The arts are always seen as some type of get over or some kind of way to some kind of way to get a grant to not do work. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate we have that misconception about them because uh, when you nurture the creativity in your in your in your younger people and in your artists, and you nurture that, sure you're going to have some people getting over. But you're going to have such a, a richer experience uh, in, in, in the world. And I know um, uh, your work with the Louis Armstrong Foundation. Oh, yeah. And we'll get the grants, $1,000 grants, which, which if, if you head to Louis uh, Armstrong Foundation on the internet, you can figure out more about that. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah, you can donate to us as Louis Armstrong's money. We're giving away the baseline. A uh, million dollars we gave away in $1,000 grants. Uh, we still have a, a, a more that we're going to give. We're just get, building the fund up a little more. And uh, all you have to do is prove you're a jazz musician. We, we're not checking people's, uh, the level that they play on or any of that. If you, and, and, and there's a need. I don't know if we, how, we, how we're opening our, round, our second round up. I don't know exactly how we're But we, uh, we see a need in the community. And we've given out 815 of those grants already and we'll have another round of grants that we give out if you want to donate to it because that thousand we figured it would help people we did we thought it would be two months so we figured hey we're going to make this hit in that second month mm. man it's going to be it's going to be four or five months so we need to we we always need resources right and i mean you know the same of course what i think is so beautiful that jazz lincoln center that you've you've curated with, with the amazing staff at Jazz Lincoln Centers supporting um, young musicians like Riley and Alexa and a, a slew of uh, other people with, we have, we just introduced yesterday the first episode On the Road with Riley on IGTV. You can check out the first episode now. Right. And he's talking to other musicians on the road and Alexa Tarantino has uh, on Thursdays um, a, a new series, their Well-Rounded Musician uh, on Zoom. So that's- Isaiah has something too, right? Does Isaiah yeah. have something with the piano players? Yeah, you know. Yes, he does on the, on a, a, every Friday. It's been really great working with him on that. He has a, a yeah. music <laughs> motivation Friday. He's been curating a really great uh, slew of talented young jazz piano players to play, you know, songs of hope and. I mean, our kids are great. The younger musicians, they're fantastic. So we have so many of them that we need to in the next. In the upcoming years, you're going to be hearing more and more about them. And I mean, I've had the pleasure, the pleasure and the privilege of knowing them, many of them since they were 13 and 14. And now they're in their 20s. And I mean, they're very serious about music. They're very, they're very deep soul and feeling. Mm. Um, we just had our Juilliard uh, graduation of some of our kids. It was, it was rough to see them go. But they were so soulful and warm toward each other. One of, one of my youngsters, great trumpet player, Joan Lamar, said of another student, Anthony Hervey, he said, you know, some of the days when I would just see Herbie's name on the, on the orchestra list and know I was going to be playing with him, just seeing his name made me feel better about what, how the day was going to go. And he described when they first met, they were out on their high school, freshman, or junior, and he said he saw Herbie with, a, with, a, with his afro. And he said, man, this kid has a big afro. 
He said when he started playing, he said he can play too. So to see them graduated from college and the type, just that type of love being expressed between, between them, when we start to talk about we have to do a Skane's Domain for the great trumpeter Lou Soloff. Mm. Because when I see the trumpet players have that type of feeling, I'm always led to think of Lou, who, uh, who supported so many trumpet players when we came to New York. Great John Faddis. I talked with John the other day. We said we're going to do Skane's. Maybe Monday we'll do it. I'm going to see what John does. And it's the love we have for Lou because Lou passed away, I don't know how many years ago. It's even painful to think about it. But he had so much love for the other trumpet players and for us. And he always nurtured you and took you to things. And I can remember concerts I went to with Lou and three or four other trumpet players. We'd be sitting up listening to somebody playing. He loved people's playing. Mm -hmm. So one day we heard Phil Smith play the Brandenburg Concerto. It was me, you, Faddis, two or three other trumpet players. And Lou the whole time was like, a, it was like his first concert when he was eight years old. He was just, and when he get to one part that was really hard to play the A's off, Phil played so much trumpet that night. He turned, did you, did you hear those A's? You know, you know just, just that type of, uh, the, just the, 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 the enthusiasm and the love is so important to have that for, and to marvel at other human beings more than a piece of technology. It's not that it's against the technology. Hmm. Technology is fantastic. But, that, but, but a human being is something that we must always prize and must always understand that the greatest experiences you're going to have is not, you hope, it's not some gadget you figured out how to work or some game you're looking at, but that it's a person you have the privilege and the pleasure of knowing. And, and even if you argue with them or just to, 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 to be able to enjoy their creativity and in the, in the, in the, the thing that's in them. Mm. Well... And on that note, and at that note too, on the pleasure of knowing, we started a new series on Jazz Lincoln Center's Facebook uh, called uh, the Sunday Spotlight, where we're spotlighting uh, JLCO members. And this past Sunday, we spotlighted Raymond Big Boss Murphy, oh, who he's boss. been the tour manager uh, for the JLCO <laughs> for about 20 years, I believe. And he's a former Navy member. So we wanted to honor him for Memorial Day. How did you first meet Raymond? <laughs> Well, my, my, my assistant at the time was a guy named Dennis Jeter, who I had met when he was 12 or 13. He told me he was a trumpet player. He really was a French horn player. Mm -hmm. So at that time, you know, always at gigs, I'm always teaching kids. And so I, he, he came back to my room and I taught him, gave him a lesson. Then he was lying about being a trumpet player. And later he became my assistant. Many years we knew each other. And when he was quitting, he said, man, you should call. I got a perfect guy for you to be the road manager. He's from my neighborhood. And me and him once fought for 45 minutes in the street. And he's Raymond Murphy. So I called, he called Raymond, and, you know, we called, we called Dennis' name was Boss Jeter, because Dennis like the boss you're around, we called him Boss Jeter. So when, when Raymond came on board, we called him Big Boss Murphy. So mm. it's Boss Big Boss. And Murphy, I always tell people about Murphy, was a military police, was a military policeman. He, was, he is a, a licensed mortician. He's a licensed truck driver. He's a master, a master of the smoked turkey. He is a deacon in the church and mm. can minister to you. And he also can do all the tile work in your house. So this guy is, I mean, he's made out of absolute gold. Mm. I, don't, I don't know what to say about him, you know. When my father was passing away in New Orleans, then New York was all quarantined, man. We didn't know whether it was COVID and New Orleans was a hot spot. He called me and said, hey, man, I'm ready to load the truck up with some tuna fish and some water, whatever you want, and we can get on the road right now. And he was serious. Now, he's talking about 30 hours of driving. Me and him had driven, oh, my God. He, he, he would drive that 30. I said, nah, man, nah, you know, I ain't going to take you to do that from your family. But that's the type of, type of person he is. Sure. You know, I mean, and we had a dispute one time, and he was going to leave the band. The entire band sat around after a 1 o'clock gig, and we had done a 9 o'clock in the morning show with some kids in Ferguson, Missouri. They sat around at 1 o'clock. After everything was finished, and said, you better not let this man go. Hmm. So I'm talking about the whole band. Every person, do not let this man make sure you work this out with him. So yeah, we love him. And uh, Vincent Gardner wrote a piece for him called Attenzione, Attenzione. <laughs> That's what he puts on the top of the daily every day when we're on the road. Oh, I didn't realize that was for him. That's, That's fantastic. For That's for the big boss. That is a man that came, you know, God pulled him out from underneath the robe and put him on earth. Because he, mm. he's one of the sweetest human beings. And just what he's made out of is just a rainbow. 
Well, if you if, if anyone tuning in wants to, to read a little bit more about him, you can head over to the Jazz Lincoln Center Facebook for his spotlight. And then every Sunday, uh, a new spotlight on JLCL member, which, of course, we love to uh, give some shout outs to the JLCO because they work so hard. Even even right now, you guys are collabing all the time. I imagine right. you're always in in constant yep. communication. Is there a lot of and I, we have a, a couple more minutes left, but I have two more things I want to touch upon. And for, with JLCO, what's it like? Co uh, collaborating right now is it like you know you have an idea so you'll you'll send a couple uh you know like a voice memo or something how does that work well it's great i'll give you an example of one that marcus printer wanted to do something for miles's birthday mm -hmm. so he said hey man i wrote this arrangement for miles birthday what's the trumpet section to do with the rhythm section okay we're gonna do it let's get it all together rhythm section recorded carlos uh obed and dan they did it then we went to, we, 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 we did the trumpet, Ryan put his part in, Marcus put his part in, I put mine, Kenny, we put our parts together, Todd put it, mixed it. Then, because we're so overlogged with everything to do, we said, who can we get to do it? Mm -hmm. uh, Adam and Chloe are working on all of the videos for, for essentially Ellington and all mm -hmm. the montages for 25 bands. I mean, they were up to, the, Victor said, I'll do it. So Vic did it. And Victor, Victor started to do it. Hey, it would took a lot longer. He worked from 12 o'clock to 5 in the morning. But then Dan's video was jumping. So mm. we, we, we wanted to get it out yesterday. We didn't get it out yesterday because we had to get Dan's video straight. And we're getting it straight. We'll probably have it out by Friday. But it's a new thing Marcus did. And then all of us are working on it. Victor mm -hmm. did the video. Marcus wrote the arrangement. We played on it. And we have, other, we have Chris Crenshaw's conglomerate is going to come out. We have everybody wear their mask that had the staff. Right. We already have done that one. And we have the New Orleans function that's already up where we do a flea as the bird, didn't he ramble? So we're, we're you know, we're going down that road. We're going we're gonna to do a new one for essentially Ellington too. We're going to figure out which, which one we're going to do. Yeah. Are you, are you hoping to do an Ellington tune or compose, compose no, something? No, no, we're going to do, do some of Duke's music. Nice. You, know, we, you know, we compose so much original music, but one of our principal tenets is you, you don't have to throw the, you don't have to throw the great grandma because you had a baby. Hmm. You can love the baby. That's good. You love the baby too. You know, you don't you have to choose. That's that that's that language that allows you to, to, to separate people so you can sell stuff to them. Hmm. We we embrace it all. Well, well, on that note, I'm embracing it all. I want to, before I kick it back to Wednesday, to, to close things out, thank you so much again for tuning in for episode eight of Wednesdays with Winton. Eight weeks we've been doing this, which is kind of wild. You know. I know it's my favorite day of the week, and I hope and I hope you guys enjoy <laughs> it as well. I want to remind you all: you can head to jazz.org for a, a schedule, a weekly schedule of all the amazing things we're offering online. We have master classes, education classes, streaming concerts. Fridays we just uh, introduced a Dizzy Concert Rewind. So every Friday at 7.30 EDT, we're releasing an archival Dizzy's concert. They're really fa fantastic. And we have uh, live streaming concerts, EE, virtual EE is happening. First ever virtual EE, June 8th week. So head to jazz.org. And Winston, thank you again. It's so lovely to see you. Hey, great to see you, Maddie, every week till we meet again. Sounds good. See you then. Hey, right. Hey, right.